Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> oh, okay. And you can see me? Okay. I don't know what it was going on about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I needed to join with, or I needed to let my microphone and oh, yeah. video camera be accessible. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> anyway, I guess it is sort of. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know what, what was going on there, but. <laughs> I'm sure anyway. Yeah, but I think it's Hello, okay. good morning. Hi, how are you? Okay. Good. <laughs> so great. Okay. I had a good conversation with uh, uh, he, he, you, and uh, Shen Guan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably, probably ruining their names. Yeah. <laughs> At any rate, uh, uh, who you might do a review article of one of the topics. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. Susan, I get you involved, but you got you're doing so many things. <laughs> I have um, still have a disaster for a house, and um, <laughs> what else? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm trying to do this Pensegrity project. I got it so that it didn't throw as many errors the other day. I oh. changed it to a quadratic Lagrangian. Okay. <laughs> and the errors disappeared. I'm going, I don't know why I did. I just thought the Lagrangian looked nice. Okay. So I, I chose that. <laughs> oh. It, oh, well. no, just, that's how I'm running with this program. Oh, what does this do? Push is, there, is there a criterion by uh, for whether or not a tensegrity structure will collapse? Um, quite often it collapses is it, if you don't make it correctly. Um, it certainly has reasons of instability. But is, is there a way of uh, just putting in a tensegrity structure and saying, does it collapse? Yes, no. Um, I'm hoping that the new, the new version of ComSol will, will actually allow that because that oh, uh, okay. they kind of give an introduction to that. And they said that it would do an experiment for you or it would, um, for instance, put in different frequencies and say where where it was unstable, rather than just throwing errors, like. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, because if you if you come across that in time, we have a deadline December thirty first. Oh my goodness! We incorporated in the paper that we're working on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, the one paper that I wanted to find that I still haven't found for you about. Um, continue, using continuous mechanics matrices to figure out tensegrities. Um, um, that actually has, uh, you can see the instability. Like they've oh. got in, um, a, a line there that, <clears throat> that shows where it's not stable. Okay, the, the analogy, <laughs> we're trying to make some analogies. The uh, the idea is that if it doesn't collapse, then we would count it as alive, and if it does collapse, it's dead. <laughs> okay. Bradley's trying to do that with the Bradenburg vehicles. Yeah. Either they move or they don't. <laughs> okay. Well, I have um. Where did I put that? Um. I've gone to and. Relatively new model of it um, that is basically a set of cells that are attached at the edge by posts. And the reason why I attached them by posts is because uh, it, they're part of a whole, whole huge tissue, and I'm only showing a part of it. So the yeah. The, but the posts represent the uh, junctions? The posts represent the rest of the tissue. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well. How many cells are you looking at? One uh, cell? Um, 
<laughs> if I could find it, it'd be great. But um, how many cells? Uh, eight or so? Is it eight? A small group. A small group, yeah, attached. Okay. Uh, why not look at seven? <laughs> In other words, one surrounded by six, which is a typical hexagonal arrangement. Oh, okay, maybe that's what I've got then. Okay, because that, uh, and then put your posts on the outside cells. Yes, that's what I did. Okay. That's what I did, yeah. Um, I'm, oh, anyway, it's annoying. I can't find what I was, what I did. I, okay. Uh, working with two different computers. This is the way things go, I guess. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Bradley, small sociological problem. Okay. <laughs> you know the work of Michael Levin? Yes. Yes. I For years I've been trying to convince him to combine his work with our work on differentiation waves. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. Yes. It looks like it's finally happened, but he's renamed okay. them. I forgot his name he used. So yes. it's as if he discovered them. Yeah, I, I saw that. Actually, I have that paper talk about yeah, today we'll talk about it but yeah i noticed okay, that too what, yeah what do we do about this i don't know you know <laughs> well you know you could write a response um well probably the best way is next the next paper on differentiation waves just say differentiation waves equivalent to yeah. <laughs> are also called that yeah all right. also called <laughs> yeah I mean, the guy's so smart, I don't see why he has to stoop so low. Yeah. <laughs> Did he have an oops moment? No, probably not. Well, you know, people used, you know, like to take terms and coin them for themselves, and, you know, there, there are differences. Had, and, had, I don't know. They had a case of that. Some guy, somebody discovered a particular protein, and then somebody else discovered it again. So they renamed it <laughs> in order to get credit for the second discovery. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it would just be also known as. <laughs> yeah, also known as. And they give the reference. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's the way we'll handle it then. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I, it was kind of a cute image of the the cells. Oh, there's one in the middle. Uh, are you sharing your screen or are you? Oh. No. It, I said I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, said, I can't find the full thing. Where <laughs> would I? No, where would I? I'm to clean up your computer. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh well, that's all right. I, yeah. Um, what did I call it? I could maybe look for it. Uh, I'll I'll continue to look for it. Um, okay. <laughs> I've lost old papers. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, not one that you've written. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean pa paper I wrote. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is. In fact, I don't know if the problems been solved yet either. It, it's. A, I was looking at it many decades ago. Uh, you, you know how, uh, you know what a bacterial flagellum is? Yeah. Okay, they grow by sending proteins down the flagellum. Yeah. The question is. How does a bacteria regulate the length of a flagellum? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I was trying to come up with a self-regulating mechanism. But I... <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Trust. Yeah. I've done a partial paper and some simulations, and uh, I saw that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame, yeah. I, yeah, I get like when I started to lose things, like when my computer crashed, uh, I learned yeah. that I just became obsessive with backing everything up. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, well, Susan knows that. I, yeah. And, and what? You know, when I had students, uh, oh. uh, I could not teach them to back up, but computer, computers could teach yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Computers are a good teacher for <laughs> some <laughs> certain things, yes. Yes, I understand. I the oh, you want to know something? Here's a pile of books. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> okay, I've I've got it. You got um, it. Okay, you I got it. Okay. okay. This is. Would you find it? Under, under my under, screen. Under, under yeah. the couch. Yeah. Huh? Yes, I found it under the couch. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Share screen. Sh share. Oh, uh, come on. Entire thing, yeah. That, that's okay. You can share the entire screen. Share. Oh, what did I have to do last time to get it to share? I think share the tab. Ah, uh, there. I have to click there on it. Yeah. There you go. All right. So it is over here somewhere. There. Oh, there we go. And. There you go. Okay. There. Oh, okay. Ah, yes. So what? Is, that's one in the middle. What's the tilt of the things? Those are the posts. What are the vertical vertical ones? Oh, they're, this is just showing how they they tilt. Oh, I see. So it's not uniform. Okay. No, it, it wasn't. This is a. I put a force, uh, four hundred. Pico Newton force downward oh. on on I think that it was this node, gotcha. and I, or it was this node, and I need to show the arrow here too. But um, anyway, um, so there's a force on it, and hey. then the the middle cell, and then we've got this one, two, three. So this is a three dimensional tensegrity structure. Yeah, so th this is the six um, cells surrounding one cell, so seven cells, tensegrity structure, a circular tensegrity structure without the twist, as I was telling you about, like the bottom is aligned with the top. So, um, okay. and they're all attached to these posts. Okay, hey, that's terrific. So yeah. you, you can do that and then look at its dynamics? Yes, as long as, as soon as I get rid of a few of the errors. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's, right. there's still four errors, and like I said, I put a quadratic Lagrangian um, calculation into this instead of uh, I forget what it was called. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to figure out what on earth I was doing, but okay. it, at least at least it gave me a picture finally. Yes. Okay, uh, that's great. Okay. Okay, because um, um, I did okay. this before. Uh, the I showed the uh, these are the um, struts or the um, yeah. compressible parts. Okay. In blue, and it wouldn't let me mesh this because they said the corners were too fine, like the. So I said, well, this is ridiculous. I just need a post or something. So I put posts. Okay. And then it seemed to work better because it, it certainly didn't want to mesh this. Okay. And I took away and said, I don't even care. I don't care what it looks like. I I put in, like I tried a, a circle first and it didn't have enough um, nodes on it it had two it made it two like two half spheres together and so there weren't any points in which i could hold my structure up with oh okay. so i made this and then it wouldn't mesh anyways so okay. I, did, um, I, I have a suggestion yeah uh, okay there's <laughs> uh, an old problem been sitting around, and that is the st stability of the cell state splitter as a tensegrity structure. And if you yeah. go back to the old, the first paper that Wade Broadland and I did, uh, the it, it shows a whole. I think it may, might be the appendix 
It shows a whole variety of possible structures for states, cell state splitters. Oh, all different, <clears throat> all different possibilities. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, the most, some of the bizarre ones were a ring of microtubules and a ring of microfilaments. Yeah. Well, okay. uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the standard one is a ring of microfilaments and a meshwork of microtubules across the surface. But the question that arose was, okay, the estimate that we got in the literature was that there were 65 microtubules. And if you assume that those are in dynamic instability, then what's the stability of the structure? Yeah, well, that's why hanging this from the, the posts or the rest of the tissue yeah. is is important because yeah. it, it's more or less a, a like i said it's a spider web um yeah you could even get to the propagation of waves through such a structure yeah yeah and that's important no you, and the, instead of putting just a single force on it you can put a, a, a sinusoidal force at, at the edge and see if it propagates yeah well, all of that, I'd like to do all of that. I just... Yeah, okay. okay. Get you're, getting, you're getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I showed it to Dr. Zhang, and he immediately said, can we discuss this? <laughs> You've departed yeah. from something, or from, he wanted to discuss it. But okay, great. I, I, have, I have backing. I found a number of references that say that the, the, well, especially our paper there on the uh, uh, tug of war uh, of actin filaments. The actin filaments are on the outside of the cell normally, and I know in epithelial yeah. cells they're attached at the nodes. So that's more or less what it looks like. Um, yeah. So Good. I've got a nice approximation of a cell. So. Good. And I'm back it with tables. <laughs> I was looking for a few more the other day, and when they're stressed, they actually put another uh, filament of actin, thick one, uh, across yeah, the cell. Yeah, the, uh, okay, that's similar. I forgot what you call the uh, focal spots or something like that. The if you have cells in t uh, in culture, they often will crawl around by putting little spots of actin down which then propagate inside the cell oh really okay i didn't know that <laughs> oh, you didn't know that <laughs> oh i do okay. So, okay um send me a note <laughs> um okay. oh by the way those cells are held down with springs like send, me, send me a reminder and i'll try to i, I think they're called focal spots i'll have to okay. okay send me a reminder i'll try to find some literature on it Okay, focal spots. I'll write this down. All right. Uh, interactive. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're part of modeling, of, I think, cell motility, amoeboid cell motility. Well, well the whole sheet will move. They've, I was reading some literature on that, too. Yeah. Yeah, some, sometimes you get a sheet, and you also get, uh, I'm not sure how to describe it, a sheet of cells which are have spaces in between the cells. Oh. Some of the cells touch forming a network of cells, and the whole network of cells moves, rather than moving as a confluent sheet. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, I wonder when that happens. The, the place I saw that was in zebrafish, pigment cells moving over the yolk sac. And the fish pigment? Yeah, we didn't. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we got our paper got rejected and never got published. Oh. <laughs> okay. So I did that with a medical student decades ago. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I think that zebrafish are Interesting enough, I might try to raise a few. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
easier than axle models. <laughs> yeah, but it, just uh, just the migration. So the pigment cells actually do move from the backbone down over the uh, yolk sac, and they seem oh. to move as this loose sheet. Okay. Okay. There might be some literature on it by now. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't kept up with the zebrafish literature. <laughs> yeah, have you had the published paper? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't looked for a long time. <laughs> oh well, I I mostly need to to concentrate on getting this okay. uh, model to work. Okay, include that in the reminder. Look, guys, it's on a different computer from this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, me and my other computer here. Yeah. Uh, this is my walking computer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that was great, Susan. Thanks. Uh, look, looking at uh, doing more with uh, Tensegrity and um, yes. yeah, it's great. You see the, yeah, you see the analogy. She can throw it together a random Tensegrity structure. Uh, we can ask, is it dead or alive? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I just I just found something here that I should could send it to. You. It says learning the stress strain fields in in digital composites using Fourier neural operator. So I guess Bradley, the general question is: if you have a structure and you have a function, oh, it's backwards, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'll send it to you. Okay. If, if you have a structure and you have a function, what is the probability of throwing the parts together that gives you something with that function? Great. Okay. And uh, no, that's basically a substitute for the question of what's alive and what's dead. Great. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, don't I why don't I just I'll write it out in the chat? So then, yeah. then everybody has has the reference, and I, I don't need to send you the whole paper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good that idea. Good. Okay. Well, hello, Morgan. How are you? Morgan joined us. Yeah, it's an eye science uh, paper. Yeah. Oh boy. So I, I'm gonna. Uh, talk about uh, this week or tomorrow, the Open Worm Foundation is having its annual meeting. And they usually, every year they have a meeting that's uh, where the board gets together and some of the senior contributors and we give updates on the projects and talk about the year going forward. So um, this year has been, you know, kind of, we've had some things going on in the, in the foundation, some things have kind of uh, sort of, uh, you know, we need more, I think we need more fresh blood in the organization, but that's just, uh, but we have done some interesting things this year. And I'm going to give a talk on Diva Worm, and I'm giving a very short talk. It's not a exhaustive talk, so I'm just going to go over some things here. And I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Good, good, good. Finally. All right. So this is the annual meeting uh, presentation. It's going to be about 10 to 15 minutes long. So um, I'm just going to go over a couple minutes of it here. Uh, I guess that's not exhaustive, but it kind of goes through the year. So one of the first things we did was the summer of code. And I wanted to highlight that because uh, we do a lot of things with OpenWorm and we're, found, uh, we're uh, sort of sponsored by OpenWorm. Uh, we had four students this year. We had Karan Lohan and Hare Krishna Pillai. Uh, and they were interested in this project called Digital Microspheres. And this is spherical computational models for embryo data. So this is, uh, which I'll show in another slide here. And then we had Jia Hong Li and Wataru Kawakami. And they did developmental graph neural networks. And this is the pipeline for the DevoLearn platform that involves these graph neural network uh, embeddings and building those from da uh, data, C. elegans data, other developmental data, and so forth. 
Um, so we had four that's a lot of students. Uh, typically we have one, maybe two, but we had four this year. Uh, so the, one of the projects was developmental graph neural networks. Uh, these are graph embeddings for analyzing cellular development. And so the, the nice thing here is that uh, Wataru and Jia Hong worked together uh, on this and they took the project and they developed a pipeline. Wataru focused on the uh, image segmentation and Jia Hong focused on implementing the graph um, embeddings. And so we got some work done this summer, I think quite a bit. Um, we got to sort of nail down the, uh, you know, the robustness of the uh, 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 image segmentation. So that was great because I think that's, you know, that's like the baseline. You have to start with a floor that's, uh, you know, sound. And so, you know, they took stuff from the DevoLearn uh, platform, which was already developed in previous years, and they developed on top of that, sort of refactored some of that code. And then Jia Hong refactored code from a paper that was published on uh, developing graph embeddings from, I believe it was embryo data. Um, so he, you know, he had a good starting point, and then he just worked on uh, making that better and fitting that into the platform. So now it's this software was brought to completion, to some level of completion, and it's now been incorporated into the DevoLearn platform. It's actually in the repository, not in the release that we have yet, but there's this DevoGraph repository at Devo, in the DevoLearn organization. And you can download the software from there. You can go through the uh, you know, documentation and the other things and, and maybe run it for yourself. So this would be this is a nice uh, addition to this DevoLearn platform. Uh, I haven't really been able to follow up on it yet. I think our students are busy. You know, they they uh, spend the summer very intensely involved in the summer of code. Then they have things to do in the fall, and then eventually, you know, they'll maybe you know come back and do some more work, or uh, you know maybe next summer we can get new people to uh, work on it some more. But we have. The DevoLearn platform, which was developed a couple of years ago, or over the past couple of years, now this DevoGraph uh, component to it. So that's going to be a nice platform. It's going to be a nice addition to that platform, and it's going to make that platform much more powerful. Uh, and so, you know, we can use the graphs. So we can use the graph uh, representations for looking at, you know, the spatial structure of embryos. We can even look at things like tensegrity. Um, and we could, you know, use that as sort of a way to extract these networks out of the biology and then put them into this uh, world of the computer. So uh, the next project was digital microspheres. This is creating an atlas and analysis tool of the embryo surface. So Susan Crawford Young has developed different uh, imaging tools such as the ball microscope, which is this nine point of view device. You can view, you can put an embryo on a stage and view it from nine points of view. You have two-dimensional data, which then needs to be piled onto a three-dimensional surface, such as we have with the embryo. So this is a screenshot of the one of the final products. We had two approaches that were kind of, you know, they're separate apps right now, but they can be made into a single platform. Uh, this is an example of the modeling. So you have these data that are tiled onto the uh, embryo surface or onto the spherical surface. And then if you tile the enough of these images and they overlap enough, you can get this sphere with uh, coordinates and with the entire surface of the embryo. And then the person using the software can explore that surface, do different types of analysis and so forth. Okay, uh, Bradley, yeah. you might emphasize that those darker lines are the uh, boundaries between cells. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so we had two approaches, and they, you know, uh, the two students did these rival approaches. They worked together because they're from the same university. They were able to work in person somewhat. They used maybe what might be complementary approaches, um, but, you know, we have to figure out how to make this into a powerful platform with the two different approaches. Uh, you know, perhaps. One approach works in some cases better than others, perhaps if we bring new organisms into it. So we, for this 
example, we used axolotl da data from the axolotl embryo, which is very big and allows you to see uh, their transparency, there's transparency in that embryo where you don't have that in other embryos. And you can, you know, it's a good model to work from, but there are other organisms that you can use as well. And that's where, you know, we may need to, uh, may, people may need to use one technique over another to get a satisfactory result. But this is, uh, this is uh, something that's going to be released. I, I don't know when we're going to do that. Um, I, I know that the two students have been busy, but again, that's, that's something that's maybe for next year. Um, then we went, we're on the virtual conference circuit, so we did a number of different talks uh, and different, uh, visited different, different conferences to get the word out about DevoWorm and what we're doing. So we were at NetSci and Network Neuroscience, which was a, a satellite session of NetSci. Uh, and this was in July 22, and this was supposed to be held in Shanghai, but uh, they had to hold it virtually. But you got to see a lot of the work uh, from some of the Chinese uh, network scientists. Um, so that was an interesting time. They had a lot of interesting work. Uh, in our case, we presented in the main session, hypergraphs demonstrate anastomoses during divergent integration. And we talked about this talk in some of the previous meetings. This is where you have a developing uh, embryo and you can extract networks out of that embryo. And then as the tissues differentiate and form distinct tissues and organs, these networks then diverge, but they still remain connected through these anastomoses. And it's kind of a loose um, anatomical analogy, but sometimes there are actual an anastomoses like you might find in the heart, but sometimes they're just linkages between the networks functionally. So, but in any case, this paper talked about hypergraphs, which are these graphs where each like hypernode contains a bunch of individual nodes and they can behave independently, but you have this meta representation where you have these nodes that are connected to one another. And so, you, and you can do a lot of interesting things with hypergraphs. You can extract um, power spectra. You can do other things that uh, you can't do with regular networks. So that's an interesting tool to bring to bear on this problem. Um, and so that, that was just a presentation on that. We also attended the INCF assembly, which was a talk from um, some of the work I'm doing uh, with another group on em developmental embodied neural simulation. And this involves some work with uh, Breitenberg vehicles, but more about um, sort of letting the nervous systems develop and different ways in which they might develop in agents. And so that, that was a poster that was presented there. Uh, finally, the SIAM workshop on network science. This was held in September, and this followed up on what was going on at NetSci. This was a different audience. This was more applied mathematicians, and it was smaller. Uh, they, they talked about a lot of interesting topics in graph theory and in, in network science. They're much more mathematical, like I said, but in this case, uh, the focus was on embodied hypergraphs, which were these kind of hypergraphs that exist in the, like that represent the anatomy from uh, uh, anterior to posterior end. So you have like the network has a polarity and it has a structure that mimics some of the uh, features of the anatomy. So anterior, posterior, left, right, and so forth. And so that's important for uh, information processing within the uh, sort of the anatomy, you know, where, where do you say get sensory information? Where does it get processed? Where is the, where are the effectors of the organism? Where, how do they move? Do they use legs? Do they use cilia? You know, where does the information come in? Where are their sensory organs? And all those things are in these embodied hypergraphs. So this is an extension of the net side work. So this is just three examples. Um, we plan to do more conferences in 2023. Then we've continued with our weekly meetings. So these are our weekly meetings uh, right now, but usually these are Mondays at 10 a.m. Eastern time in North America. So if you're in North America, you can get you know, the meetings in the morning. And if you're on the West Coast, it's early morning. And then if you're in Europe, it's afternoon, late afternoon. In India, it's evening. 
and in East Asia, it's, you know, late at night, but uh, we try to make it accessible. Uh, so this is an example, you know, of a Slack message calling people together for the meeting. Uh, we have topical reviews uh, on different topics, like we just talked about tensegrity, but we also have, you know, we bring papers to bear a lot of times and go through them uh, on a number of topics, morphogenesis, embryophysics, approaches to imaging, systems biology, developmental biology. Uh, then we have uh, biology and computation updates. So these are updates on people's projects. Uh, a lot of times during GSOC, we'll have people give weekly updates on their projects, uh, but these can be demos or things about collaboration management, which we haven't had in a while, but we do that. And then papers and presentations. So people want to give a presentation like we had a couple weeks ago, uh, the floor is open for that. And then finally, the tutorials that we usually do to share information about different things, like we've had tutorials on Jupyter and Colab notebook use, model building, and other technical topics. So, you know, again, those are things that uh, forward learning in, in the meetings, help forward people to do work on their own uh, and, you know, really give give people an idea of what's going on under the hood of some of these talks and papers and things like that. Uh, then we have this innovative new theme, which is uh, cognition and psychophysics and cells and embryogenesis. And this comes from two papers that are uh, sort of ongoing. This one is going to be published in the book Mathematics and Biology of Diatoms. This is a paper called The Psychophysical World of the Motile Diatom Bacillaria Paradoxa. So this paper um, is more or less just kind of a review of different techniques from what we call the psychophysical field, where they're looking at um, sensory inputs and, you know, response times or other types of uh, things that organisms do in response to sensory stimuli. And so, you know, it's a little bit hard to do, you know, you can do experiments in small organisms, you can do experiments in single organisms, sometimes without a brain. Um, but to have like a collection of things that you might be able to, how you might be able to interpret some of those things, we don't really have that. So this is why this paper exists. Um, so for example, people have looked at single cell organisms for over a hundred years and they've surmised that there's some sort of cognition or life force or something uh, going on in the cell. And of course the cell doesn't have a brain, but it's still doing things. It's responding to stimuli. And so how does it do that without a brain? And so there are a number of techniques that are listed in the paper that, you know, you might visit or be revisited to interpret some of these things. And so we have a sing colony of single cell organisms here. There are a number of different technique modeling techniques by which you can better understand some of these responses to stimuli uh, and, and other things. So this is one example. And then the latest example is this embodied cognitive morphogenesis as a route to intelligent systems. This is a paper where we're taking, this is a, uh, for a special issue of Royal Society Interface Focus on Symmetries in Life and Mind, or in Mind and Life. So the journal was Royal Society Interface Focus, and there's a special issue. Um, and uh, the idea here is to take some of these concepts that we talk about in the meeting uh, and talk about them as sort of this way to look at information processing and morphogenesis, but also the role of the body itself. So the body of the organism as it's developing plays a key role in some of this. And so we're using things like differentiation trees. This is an example from uh, sea squirts that was done in another paper that we did. And it just shows the symmetry and uh, fluctuating asymmetry and symmetry breaking events in that embryo. Uh, this is a tensegrity structure. These two things are tensegrity structures. And we're making the point that you can use tensegrity to sort of understand the uh, the body of these organisms. So they have to have a rigid body or something that's structurally sound. And so, you know, there's that aspect of it. And then we also use the embodied hypergraphs as well. And I don't have a picture of those here. But, Bradley? Yeah. It's the funniest side. The... Uh... Uh, C, the one on the right. Yeah. Look, 
looks like a Monopoly board. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's Monopoly for uh, C squirts, I guess. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, anyways, that's that's nice. There, it's a kind of a new theme that's emerging here, and this is something that we may bring bring our tools to bear, both the uh, imaging to or the an analytical tools and the theoretical tools. And then finally, I'd like to thank our contributors for this year. I think I have a complete list. It's kind of hard to find it. Remember everyone who's like participated in the group, but this is we have a pretty decent list this year, and. Uh, so that's all I have for that. Um, we have some things in the chat here. Okay, so yeah, Susan shared a paper, uh, learning the stress strain fields in digital composites using Fourier neural operator. That was the iScience paper. Okay. Um, okay, and so yeah, that's it. So oh, and then there's a oh yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, do we have any comments about that or questions? Susan, you're muted. Susan, you're, you're, you're muted. <laughs> I, I'm muted because of the phone going yeah, on. I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I definitely need to find that paper for you that um, where they have a technique that shows you the um, places where the structure's in, unstable. Yeah. Um, yeah, they did four examples of tensegrity structures and uh, showed the re regions where it was unstable. And um, actually, I think I need to do that type of analysis for what I'm doing as well. And it's, uh, they say it's a continuum model. Um, and there's definitely um, a bunch of linear algebra involved. <laughs> so um, I'll, I need to. Is it, is it correct that you can represent tensegrity structure by a matrix? Yes. You can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in in that, that lab. Okay. In that so, lab. Bradley, from the from the point of view of this origin of life stuff. Is there any sense in which we can make a random matrix and make a tensegrity structure from it? Ah, it could be, yeah. Yeah, I know what Susan's talking about. The book that she shared a couple weeks ago, I went through it. And they actually mm -hmm. have some MATLAB code for, like, the stability modes. I'm not sure if it's something that is uh, you can really make a lot of sense of, though. Um, like, you run the code and it gives you, like, a number. I would have to, would have to do some more... Uh, discussion about how to do that, but I think it might be possible. Yeah, that's a bit cold, but yeah, are there constraints on the matrix which makes it a tensegrity matrix? Um, I, I need to get that other paper. It, it, uh, it, it, with the GAN paper and then that, this next one. Okay, it, I guess it's I'm challenging. To, to take off. <laughs> okay. I guess what I'm doing is challenging you, Susan. Can you make a random matrix and then draw what tensegrity structure represents? Yeah. I haven't gotten in enough into that linear algebra. I need the paper. I need okay. my, my structure to work. And I need to do some digital experiments on it. Okay. And I need to write up a thing that's 6,000 words long, hand it in, and hopefully they, that will be my candidacy project. And then we can do some of these other things which yeah. are more important. <laughs> other than okay. filling up the console to see if... if yeah, I, I went through that uh, as a kid. I thought at the end of that my career was over. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, well, at least in the, uh, this other paper that I have yet to find, it, it made sense to me. It was... The linear algebra in it was looking good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's all I can say, because me and linear algebra don't always see eye to eye. Okay. That's uh, a weird field. Yeah. Well, the, the signal processing these days is all matrices, so, and probability. Yeah, I don't know if I told you the the, uh, the yeah. funny uh, situation. I was that I attended a night course on linear algebra. Uh, it's in Washington D.C. 
and I was the only student who asked any questions. And then we had a party when this course was over, and I asked the, the instructor why I was the only one who asked questions. He said, well, it was a remedial course for kids trying to get into mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> and this, <laughs> to me, it was a sophisticated update on my mathematics <laughs> of linear algebra. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> it was a real put down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just shut off my oh, okay. um, yeah. video because it's, it's uh, using up too much bandwidth again. Oh, yeah. okay. I, I, I have. A um, fiber optic cable that comes right up to the side of my house, and they attached it to the side of my house. Oh. <laughs> it's just the link between that and my computer is missing. Oh. <laughs> and when they will do that, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sometime. <laughs> yeah. So actually, I wanted to bring up the... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I wanted to bring up that paper we talked about earlier about the differentiation waves, I think it is. Uh, let's see if I can find oh. it here. Yeah, here it is. So this was a paper that came out recently. This is uh, Joel Grodstein and Michael Levin, Closing the Loop on Morphogenesis, a Mathematical Model of Morphogenesis by Closed Loop Reaction Diffusion. And in in their in the paper, they talk about these waves that are very similar to differentiation waves. And I don't know how similar or dissimilar they are, um, but we can go through the abstract and see where they're going with this. So uh, the abstract reads, yeah, morphogenesis, the establishment and repair of emergent com complex anatomy by groups of cells, that was their definition, morphogenesis is a fascinating and biomedically relevant problem. One of its most fascinating aspects is that a developing embryo can reliably recover from disturbances, such as splitting into twins. So this is more like focused on like regeneration, I guess. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, kind of not, I, I don't know if that's like the norm of, like if you had an embryo, I mean, you could do experiments with it and show this, but. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a very old experiment. Yeah, uh, yeah. 1890s or so. Right. <laughs> and it had various results. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sometimes you get two twins, but uh, if you didn't quite split the cells apart, I think you got something else. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, this reliably implies some type of goal-seeking error minimization over a morphogenetic field. So this is the idea that, you know, you have this error minimization process. You want to minimize errors, and there's some goal. And there's this morphogenetic field. I think we've talked about these with Tom Portages. And uh, this was, like, the, one of the things that we discussed in the context of morpho, um, morpho, uh, morphonosis or morphonostic. One of the things he was working on where uh, he was calling the morphogenetic fields and he didn't like that. Dick didn't like that term uh, because it has a sordid history. But I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, well, the, uh, the morphogenetic field was mis mystical concept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so there are many gaps with respect to detailed constructive models of such a process being used to implement the collective intelligence of cellular swarms. So this is now you're moving from these sort of embryo experiments and, and regeneration to uh, cellular swarms and collective intelligence. So this is like the cells basically in an embryo or have some sort of collective intelligence. We know that it's not necessarily intelligence, but it's collective behavior really is the key. Okay. Uh, can I ask a stupid question here? Yeah. It uses a cellular automaton to characterize a morphogen, morphogen pattern then compares it to a goal and adjusts accordingly. Yeah. What is it? Uh, well, okay, we described... A, it, sounds, we, it sounds to me like it is a brain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the first sentence here is, we describe a closed-loop negative feedback system for creating a reaction diffusion pat or creating reaction diffusion patterns with high reliability. 
And then it, I guess, is the reaction diffusion pattern of, or the closed-loop negative feedback system, maybe. Yeah, but is who it? looks at the pattern? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so the, there's a, some sort of uh, feedback system. It creates this reaction diffusion pattern, and then it uses it, I guess, being this, uses a cellular yeah, okay. automaton. Uh, yeah. Let me interject something at this point. There was a paper by, I think, Barry Buno. Okay. Probably in the 1960s or 70s which showed that reaction diffusion patterns were extremely sensitive to the boundaries of formula. Okay. Okay, now of course this didn't have any feedback, it just shows patterns varied. Uh, but something has to, in this model, something has to see the pattern. Yeah. And it's not obvious, at least from the abstract, what they're talking about. Yeah. Well, see it or evaluate it. I mean, like if, if there's a state that's generated from it, uh, but of course it yeah, has to be created. No, uh, how do you, you know, if I show you a picture, a distorted picture of somebody, uh, the picture doesn't clean it, it's distorted. You do. Yeah. Okay. So how does how does a cell react to the global pattern? Right. That's kind of, you know, because the cell has to be what conceives of what's going on. Yeah. So, yeah, and then uh, let's see. Uh, I'm not so, sure this is logically sound. Yeah. <laughs> so th then this provides a framework for modeling anatomical homeostasis and robust generation of target morphologies. So I guess the target yeah, morphology I, is one of the things that, like, you're you know what a beautiful girl looks like, then you can make a, yeah. a sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's been, a, there's been a fair amount of work on, like, simulating, uh, like, embryogenesis or, like, simulating embryos. And a lot of the times they have to use a target, like, um, you know, like, basically a full embryo. So, which is kind of cheating because we don't know if like yes, biology does that. Exactly, there's but, no target. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like. I oh, go ahead. yeah, I lost track of a quote. I couldn't find out. I haven't been able to figure out who said it, but somebody said that an aberrant, if if you have uh, an aberrant embryo, that it goes and makes that aberrant embryo with the same uh, reliability as if it were normal. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. In other words, if you regard it as a goal setting, its goal is completely screwed up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But uh, I'm, I find it hard to believe that an embryo has goal has a goal in mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what we see with uh, defined mutants and C. elegans. You have a, a defined mutant, and it has like some sort of defect, and it won't necessarily correct. It's just kind of keeps reproducing that defect. It just goes to, yeah, it does the yeah. same defect every time. Right. right. <laughs> okay. And the only difference is that uh, evolution takes care of that by eliminating the defective ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So specifically, we create a reaction diffusion pattern with N repetitions where N is easily interchangeable. Furthermore, the individual repetitions of the RD pattern can be easily stretched or shrunk under genetic control to create, e.g., some morphological features larger than others. So this is like uh, size and, and shape control. So this uh, is... The, what was that? The computation where it scans the pattern. Okay, yeah, the computation. That's there. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. again, the word scan is loaded with uh, the concept of perception. Yeah. Okay. How does a wave perceives the pattern? Yeah. So that's yeah, and then this computation wave, which they'll define later, scans the morphogen pattern unidirectionally to characterize the features that the negative feedback then controls. So you have this cellular automaton. It's using this computation wave, which I guess goes over the the surface. Okay. It scans the pattern, it characterizes the features, and then negative feedback uses that to 
control the future iterations of it. So I guess it corrects for things. Uh, so it's basically like there's this, I guess, this field. And you have to remember that Michael Levin works on um, flat ones, which are these, uh, you know, uh, organisms yeah, that have the single cell that can regenerate an entire organism. And he's argued that there are some, uh, you know, you, there may be some bioelectric fields that involve like telling that single cell what the target adult or the target organism should look like. So, I mean, you can gener regenerate something from a single cell, reproduce an right. entire organism. It has to be so. I have a good bioelectric field. They're called uh, calcium pulses. And the calcium pulses are simply actomyosin interactions using ATP. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Could we? Okay. There was a guy named uh, Mary. Of course, I haven't checked that out at all, but yeah. it just seems yeah. possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. What the, they're not really identifying a specific mechanism here, but in this case, it's just this. this system. Okay, there, yeah. there was a guy named Mariama. All right. Uh, who in the 1980s, he was a sociologist. Okay. And in the 1960s, he wrote a very interesting paper. Uh, I forgot the exact title, but it, it was on positive feedback systems. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I mean, here they're invoking negative feedback. But the negative feedback is towards a goal. Great. Whereas the positive feedback system is just, uh, oh, they were, uh, I, okay, I think I remember it. It's mutually, mutually deviating causal processes. Something like this. Hard to remember. Mutually deviating. Okay. Yeah. Mutually deviating one? Oh, well, causal processes, I think. Okay, that's what I'm recalling. It was a long time ago. Yeah. AKA explosions. Yes. <laughs> it's an explosion. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, if you want nice ones, look at fireworks. Very cute, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So this whole question of uh, how do you get development without negative feedback from an image, from a goal? You know, I mean, I find it hard to believe that the embryo knows what it's going, what it should look like. Right. If that were true, you wouldn't have aberrant embryos. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Unless the aberration is in the brain of the embryo that's looking at what the embryo should be. Great, great. <laughs> okay. So I think this is a bunch, it sounds like a bunch of uh, wishful thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this is basically, it just, yeah, they kind of go through. So why don't we go through I mean, into the, oh, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So let's see, they, they talk about some of this in more detail in the paper. They give some mathematical formulations. They talk about in terms of reaction, diffusion, positional information, and scaling. So uh, how can collections of cells cooperate to reliably produce the same species-specific target morphology? And then they talk about planarian flatworms, of course, which is the example I just talked about. Uh, amphibian embryos maintain the right proportions even when many cells are missing or made too large. So this is homeostasis, homeostatic properties. And so that's what they're trying to sort of understand with this. And then this is, of course, extended to this idea of collective intelligence, shown as how groups of cells, competent in physiological and metabolic spaces, and solve okay, problems me, in anatomy. Let me give you an example. Okay. A drop of water rounds into a sphere, no matter how many water molecules are present. Yeah. What is the intelligence of the sphere? <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. You know, I think I think they're missing something here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, so what? If, 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 if there's a global local interaction, you can get things like this. Right. Yeah, I know. That's something they don't mention here. Uh, and that's, of course, important in like things like emergence. and. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, why is this? Why is a drop of water spherical independent of the number of molecules? Yeah. Down to a, you know, a very small number. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, physics. Yeah, <laughs> it's physics. Not <laughs> the physics. Yeah, I don't think the water droplet knows what it's doing. Right, right. <laughs> it's just constrained by like its physics and yeah. Yeah, but the physics is at the global level. So this is this is where you get this uh, Janus-based approach, an interaction between the local and the global. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to the reason the Jan yeah. Oh, what was it about Janus face? Yeah, well, the, the the place where the Janus face comes in is that the global can change it to local, which in the case of differentiation waves is the differentiation state of the cells. Right. Okay. Now I don't know if that's robust or not. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's one question we'll have to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because it is a positive feedback system with some negative feedbacks locally yeah. between differentiation waves and the tissues they go through. Yeah. So, uh, so you might kind of ask that question: What is the stability of a differentiation tree? Mm -hmm. Right. The more branches it's got, it would seem to be less stable. But is there any evidence for that? Or are, or are there negative feedbacks at many different stages and at many different scales? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just writing some notes here. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's time to try to build a worm from oneself. Yeah. See, yeah. <laughs> see if. Not, not not do it in, in experimentally, but do it in, in computing. See if one gets the same structure every time, taking into account reasonable deviations. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think that's kind of one of the fundamental questions of embryogenesis: is how in the hell does the thing keep itself together? Right. Without without a brain. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they do a lot of computational modeling. I was trying to find the definition of a computation wave, but I couldn't. I, I don't know. You can't put my finger on it here. Um, yeah. Because it's, it's it is similar to uh, a differentiation wave. Uh, I was reading through, but I just can't remember where it is. So, but this is the idea that uses computation wave as sort of like, um, it's okay, here we go. Uh, we have demonstrated, yeah, so they talk about here, uh, it achieves this goal with a closed loop negative feedback controller that, number one, employs a cellular automata to count peaks, so peaks of like activity or something, and thus count the current number of pattern repetitions. It uses computation wave fronts. So this is a powerful concept in cellular computing. So this is actually something people, I think, have come up with in this field of cellular computing uh, that takes advantage of the assist, existing asymmetry. So I'm not familiar where is with the cellular Where is the cellular automaton? <laughs> oh, you mean in there? I, I don't know. Yeah. Is it part of the embryo? I guess it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's either it's supposed to be the embryo or some sort of like representation of it. Okay, so the embryo has a mirror and says, oh, yeah, I look good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure. Even though, yeah. Even though it doesn't have eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, okay. yeah, yeah, so uh, then I don't know if they define any more about it. Like, it's just kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, you, if you can get anything else out of this besides 
a bunch of mathematics covering up ignorance, <laughs> let me know. Okay. All right. I really don't like. <laughs> okay. Well, well I, yeah. I like Mike Levin, but I think this is, oh. you know, he's trying to be Mr. Embryo, embryogenesis, uh, you know, coming out of his bioelectric work. So, oh. and he's sophisticated mathematically. I know that. He knows more math than I do. But uh, this is not convincing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I think that's probably enough for today. Um, did we have anything else we wanted to talk about? Or? Well, hopefully you can go over the uh, ring of cells that um, decide to move. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. That's at some point that I assume that's sort of how you get a, what is it, cuffer vesicle in um, zebrafish. And then the, that determines it's a breaks this left right symmetry in zebrafish. Okay. And that's, I sent you that, so someday, not today. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Bradley, you yeah. can try to get Mike Levin to give us a review lecture on computational uh, waves. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Oh, we'd like to know more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see if we see if we can get anything out of it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There, I think that. Yeah, I don't know if this is a concept that people use in like a specific field. I, I think uh, it may be, but I don't know. Do a search on the term and see if it, any other papers come up. Yeah. Yeah. It's always amazing what people are doing in fields you don't know about, like. <laughs> And then you know, it's find out what the definitions are, and but yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I'd like to talk about a group of papers um, that involves morphogenesis and the development of materials. Bio. Uh, Okay, now I'd like to talk about a, a group of papers that I have collected over the past several months on a number of top related topics related to morphogenesis, the development of tissues, and the development of uh, biomaterials within those tissues. And so uh, this will be pretty wide ranging, but hopefully you get some things out of it. So the first paper is this uh, caught by a cellular skeletal web, and this is kind of an overview paper in Nature Physics. Uh, this is on physics of the cell. And the preview reads, uh, biomolecular condensates grow in busy cellular environments. Statistical image analysis of heterogeneous structures uh, now enables quantification of macro macromolecular interactions between condensates and cytoskeletal filaments. So we were talking earlier about tensegrity, and we were talking about cells being the nodes in those networks and filaments being the edges or the rods, sometimes they call them intense equity. Uh, and this is exactly the kind of thing, these cytoskeletal webs, that are relevant to this work on tense equity. <clears throat> so the paper starts, it is becoming increasingly apparent that living cells rely on the dynamic and self-organized compartmentalization of specific, specific molecular components. The formation of regions and cells with distinct biochemical composition or a stri striking resemblance to the partitioning of molecular species and phase separation systems. And this is where you may have like two liquids that are of different densities and they separate out so that you can see bands in them as they approach equilibrium. So these uh, regions of cells will form these condensates, these uh, little masses, and they're basically, it's phase separation because they have different regions of bio, uh, biochemical specialization. In cellular systems, however, the condensation of biomolecules must occur in a multi-component uh, environment that is not in equilibrium. So in cells, of course, not a lot is in equilibrium. You can't really assume that. Thus, understanding the mutual interactions between biomolecular condensates and the diverse cellular structures that surround them is crucial for both our quantitative understanding of cell biology and our appreciation of non-equilibrium intracellular biochemistry. And so this covers a, number, a couple of papers in this issue. 
uh, writing in Nature Physics, Thomas Boddicker and colleagues now provide relevant insights regarding biophysics of stress granules and the microtubule network. And they kind of go through a little bit about this paper. Uh, they talk about stress granules, which are biomolecular condensates. Uh, so they have a picture here. This is figure one. This is where you have a cell with its nucleus. And in the cytoplasm, you have these microtubules, which actually are you know, enveloping a lot of the, the cytoplasm. They keep the structure of the cytoplasm and the uh, parts of the cell that aren't the nucleus. And they actually, they act to work in the nucleus as well, but they basically are home to these stress granules. So these stress granules are within, been embedded within this microtubule network. Then they actually take images of cells and they take high resolution images where they can get these condensates with their microtubule associations. And they take a number of images, they average over them, and this looks like a combination of images where they overlay everything, and they get a network with this condensate in the middle. And then they actually analyze this further, they zoom in, and they find that the microtubules connect to the stress granule, and there are these individual tubule and subunits that kind of sit outside the grain, on the edge of the granule. So this is where they adhere to the, or the microtubules rather adhere to the stress granule on these, on these subunits and form the network. And the network reconfigures over time as, as the needs of the cell change. So that's an interesting thing, not necessarily with respect to tensegrity, but definitely with respect to what's going on in the cell. And certainly as these networks reconfigure, we can say things about the stability of the cells, the biochemistry, local biochemistry of the cells, and some of these global local interactions. So that's an interesting uh, uh, first paper. The second paper I want to talk about here is something we've talked about a couple times in different uh, meetings, and this is this uh, curvature in, in developing tissues. So this is an epithelial cells in a sheet where epithelial cells adapt to curvature induction by a transient active osmotic swelling. So you can see from the graphical abstract here, you have this, uh, this sheet of cells act in the epithelial layer and this bilayer. Then you have a flat sheet that develops. Then you have this, this uh, curvature that occurs through a number of mechanisms here. And you actually see this rolling is a persistent curvature induction. So it starts on one end and it rolls over to the other end and there's this curvature that occurs in the, the, the sheet now looks like this. You have a new tissue equilibrium in this curve shape. So this flat sheet is in equilibrium. And as this rolling process occurs, there's an instability. Then as this rolling kind of reaches its conclusion by reaching another part of the sheet, then it goes back into equilibrium. And you can see that there's this profile here in time where the actin, the membrane tension, and the cell volume all change. The cell volume goes up, the actin uh, goes down, and the membrane tension goes down slightly, and then recover. they all recover to the uh, pre-perturbation point when they were in equilibrium in this flat sheet. So it's an interesting um, way to look at this process. Uh, this is an in brief uh, they examine the response of epithelial cells to rapid changes in curvature. So this is a rapid process. It takes about maybe 13 or 14 minutes to have this entire process uh, complete. So it's not very long. Uh, they show that upon curvature induction, cell volume transiently increases, which means it increases briefly, but not permanently, while membrane tension decreases and actin depolymerizes. So actin is falling and then comes back up. So it's depolymerizing during this process. Actin repolymerization and membrane tension recovery restores cell volume and forces it into a new curved configurature. So this is um, this involves um, some other molecular mechanisms as well. Um, they propose that this folding induces a mechanoosmotic feedback loop that involves ion channels. So there are, again, other processes underneath the anatomy that we need to be aware of as well. So the summary reads, generation of tissue curvature is essential to morphogenesis. However, how cells adapt to changing curvature is still unknown because tools to dynamic weight control curvature in vitro are lacking. So here they develop self-rolling substrates 
to look at these changes. There's an anisotropic change of curvature, which means that occurs not evenly across that sheet. We show that primary response is in, in an active and transient osmotic swelling of cells. So there's a swelling of cells. The cell volume increases. The cell volume increase is not observed on inducible wrinkled substrates where concave and convex regions alternate each other over short distances. So where you have a, an inducible wrinkled substrate, you don't observe this volume increase, only in these flat sheets. And this finding identifies swelling as a collective response to changes of curvature with a persistent sign over large distances. It is triggered by a drop in membrane tension and actin depolymerization, which is perceived by cells as a hypertonic shock. So osmotic swelling restores tension while actin reorganizes, probably to comply with curvature. So we have this ability to have these different aspects of the cell sheet, individual cells, and across individual cells uh, regulated in a time sequence. And this contributes to sort of going from a stable state to an unstable state and then back to a stable state. You can see here that you have this curvature here, but they prepare this uh, they make this preparation and then they show the curvature uh, through microscopy. And yeah, so they have, uh, this is a nice paper if you're interested in this topic, an interesting set of experiments there. This paper is uh, talks about an echolocation-like model of directed cell migration. So we talked about cells curving and acting collectively. We've talked about condensates in the formation of networks. Now we can talk about an echolocation-like model of directed cell migration within growing tissues. So what is this all about? Uh, this is, uh, so during development and regeneration, cells migrate to specific locations within growing tissues. These cells can respond to both biochemical signals and mechanical cues, resulting in directed migration. So there's this, there are these cues in the environment, it's responding to them, it's moving towards them using different types of taxes and other types of uh, very simple responses. Such migration is often highly stereotypic. Of course, it means that there's a very predictable way in which this migration occurs. Yet how cells respond to migratory signals in a robust manner within a growing domain remains an open problem. Here we propose a model of directed migration in growing tissues motivated by echolocation. The migrating cells generate a signaling gradient that induces a response signal from the moving system boundary. This response signal mediates cellular adhesion to the surrounding matrix and hence modulates the cell migration. We find that such a mechanism can align a series of cells at stable positions within growing systems and effectively scale the system size. Finally, we discuss the relevance of such a model to fibroblast migration and location within the developing zebrafish autofit. So they use an animal model to look at fibroblast migration, um, which may be regulated by opposing signal gradients of slit robopathway components. So they're using molecular gradients to sort of uh, guide these processes. So you have sort of a response to a, a stimulus, and you also have this molecular gradient, which serves as a constraint. And so this is a, this is a mechanism that can align cells in different positions stably, so we don't have to, you know, we don't have this sort of random process that doesn't really lead to a stable phenotype. So this is an interesting, uh, this is, okay, so let's see if we find some graphs here. Uh, this is the echolocation model for cell migration. So these echolocation in quotes. But basically you have this source and you have a response. So the response goes in this direction here and the source is here. So there's a source and a response by the cell. Um, so in A, illustration of the model of single cell migrating in one dimension, a cell migration or migrates in, in the system of length L that grows at rate V sub dom. And so there's a rate, there's a, a characteristic length that it generates when it's uh, triggered by a stimulus. The cell generates a source signal, SXT, with that elicits a response signal RXT from the system boundary at uh, X equals LT, proportion to SLTT. The cell speed V sub cell is a function of the response signal and it detects at R X sub C T. 
uh, cell migration speed is modeled with the phenomenological function here, where uh, y equals uh, some of the components from the first part. Um, so they were just basically showing that there's this response that we characterize mathematically, and that the response curve here, there's a source and uh, over time, and then a response over time. And so they work out their theoretical model. It's a lot of mathematical modeling. Um, and then they say in the results that biphasic response of cell velocity to signal allows for boundary detection. So there's this cell velocity that results from a signal and it can detect, uh, there's a biphasic response that can be involved in boundary detection. So um, cells need to reach a final position. They can't just migrate forever. And this is one of the things that helps them do that. As the cell approaches the, the final position or the boundary, our uh, XC, they define this mathematically, is this gradually, this boundary gradually increases, this causes the cell to slow to a stop due to increased adhesion. So there's this adhesion mechanism that occurs as some of these, uh, as these mechanisms change, and that basically, it's kind of like a, putting down a sticky surface at the end of a, a ramp to slow down things. Um, They also, you know, they do they do a lot of modeling in this paper. So this is all a lot of modeling. There's some observation, but you have this, basically you're trying to work out a model of echolocation. Echolocation-like behavior can enable cells to position separately within a domain without the need for processes such as contact inhibition. So they're trying to figure out uh, sort of a way to have like a, almost like a sensory domain and maybe sensory processing without implying that there needs to be an intelligence. A lot of this is controlled by physics and physical constraints. So, and then this shows, uh, actually, this is mesenchymal cell migration in the zebrafish median finfold. So this is where you have the finfold developing from zero hours to 24 hours. And you see in this case where you start to get cell migration and they migrate out to this boundary. And so you can see how they arrange themselves. They respond to a signal and they radiate out as they migrate, and they form this structure. Okay. The next paper we're going to talk about here is this paper, 3D Organization of Cells and Pseudostratified Epithelia. And so this is, again, another paper about the epithelium and how cells are organized and stratified. And so they talk about this in three dimensions, which is often missed in a lot of the biology we look at. We look at these two-dimensional images, but we have to consider the third dimension. So pseudostratified epithelia have smooth apical and basal surfaces. Yet along the apical basal axis, cells assume highly irregular shapes, which we introduce as uh, punicoids. They interact dynamically with many more cells than visible at the surface. Here we review a recently developed new perspective on epithelial cell organization. So this is some a review of this seemingly random at first sight. The cell packing configurations along the entire apical basal axis follow fundamental geometrical relationships. So in this case, it isn't so much the physics, it's the geometry that's sort of uh, constraining things. This geometry minimizes the lateral cell-cell contact energy for our driven cross-sectional cell variability. So in this case, you have these, these energy constraints that are um, that sort of minimize the energy that's used in a cell-cell contact. So this is not just geometrical, but there is a physics component to this as well. Um, the complex 3D cell-neighbor relationships in pseudostratified epithelia that emerge thus emerge from a simple physical principle. And this principle is, of course, a uh, uh, energetic constraint. This paves the way for the development of data-driven 3D simulation frameworks that will be invaluable in the simulation of epithelial dynamics in development and disease. So they're really kind of where the idea here is if you can develop a mathematical model or a characterization, especially with physics and geometry, you can develop a software platform that can simulate these things. So this is why we're interested in this type of thing. Again, they talk about the 3D cell shapes. Um, so as 3D segmentation of cells has become possible only very recently, 3D cell shapes have long been depicted as prisms 
which retain the same size and neighbor relationship along the entire apical basal axis. So as we sort of were imaging three-dimensional contexts now, in the past, people have really kind of thought of these cell shapes as prisms. They've thought of them as uniform. And what we're finding with some of this imaging is that that's not the case. Uh, cells in curved epithelial monolayers are commonly pictured as frusta, or bottle cells, as the apical and basal areas must differ. Uh, differences in neighbor arrangements between the apical and basal side points to the neighbor changes along the apical basal axis in a range of epithelia. So there are things like prismatoids that accommodate the neighbor change in either surface. Um, and so there are different ways that these things can vary, the different types of relationships. Uh, they come up with a term, term scutoid, which is where the if, if the neighbor relationships change somewhere in between the apical and basal axis, the cell shape is reminiscent of that formed by beetle scutum, scutellum, and wings, which are these scutoids. Uh, with, up to four, with up to 14 neighbor changes along the apical basal axis, pseudostratified epithelium cells developing in the mouse lungs, however, resemble more of the pancake rock formations at Punakaiki in New Zealand's west coast. So they have these different names that they derive from different things in the world. Um, this, these are these uh, punicoids. These are, so you can see them in a sort of an imaging context. Uh, so let's see if we can figure this out here. So this is a scutellum. This is the shape of this beetle. Uh, this is uh, Punakaiki in New Zealand. So these are these punicoids. And then the punicoids are just like a repetition of this sort of arrangement of rocks. And so they're using this as an analogy. And these are an epithelial cell. So you see they look kind of maybe like rocks, but they're actually epithelial cells. So you have a number of phenomena here. You have the increase and decrease of neighbors uh, with the frequency of T1 transitions and the position relative to the nucleus. And then the distance from the apical uh, axis and the cell area variation, you can see that as well. And so there's a neighborhood increase and a neighborhood decrease, and there's variation around this mean. Um, so this is there are these processes where the two vertices that share an edge merge and decompose in a different direction, such as neighbor relationships change. So you have this process where there's changing, you have changes in neighbor relationships, the cell changes shape. And there are these very complex three-dimensional shapes so that there's a lot of variation over, over the course of the development of the epithelium. This is another uh, figure. These are phenomenological laws in epithelial cell arrangements. So in A, we have uh, the mouse embryonic lung, lung epithelium, and we're slicing through it from the apical to the basal surface. And we see that they have these different cross sections where we have these different neighbor arrangements. So in this first cross section, which is closer to the apical surface, you have certain, uh, I guess, their neighborhoods. And then you have this, uh, these are polygonal abstractions of the cells. Uh, and then you have these different T1 transitions as you move towards the basal surface. So this cross section closer to the basal surface has a different arrangement. And so, uh, what they have to say about that is that uh, this reveals the complex shape and packing structure of pucanoids. Uh, even over short distances, numerous T1L transitions occur, leading to vastly different cell relation, cell neighborships, they call them. Um, and so this is definitely, you know, a nice way to show that these things are not uniform, that there's a lot of heterogeneity and variation across single cell groups, even. Uh, so this is this is nice. This is uh, this shows kind of some of these things that um, you have these different things like the polygonal distribution, the Abov Weir law, uh, which is the mean neighbors neighbors measure, the Lewis law, and the cellular dispersity. And so there are different ways you can measure this. Okay, and then our final paper here is the adhesive forces network. And this goes back to networks again. And uh, this is where we have 
nonspecific adhesive forces between filaments and membraneless organelles. And so this is the paper by Boddicker that was mentioned in the first paper. So um, this is also nature physics. So uh, many membraneless organelles are liquid-like domains that form inside the active viscoelastic environment of living cells uh, through phase separation. So these are these, uh, these condensates and then the networks of filaments. To investigate the potential coupling of phase separation with the cytoskeleton, we quantify the structural correlations of membraneless organelles, or these stress granules, and a cytoskeleton filaments, or these microtubules, in a human-derived epithelial cell line. We find that microtubule networks are substantially denser in the vicinity of stress granules, which we saw in that image, uh, that figure in the first paper. When microtubules are depolymerized, the subunits localize near the surface of the stress granules. This means that when the microtubules fall apart, the subunits localize. And then we interpret these data using a thermodynamic model of partitioning of particles to the surface and bulk of the droplets. In this framework, our data are consistent with a weak affinity of the microtubule sub subunits or stress granule interfaces. As microtubules polymerize, their interface interfacial affinity increases, providing sufficient adhesion to deform droplets and or the network. So there's a, re a depolymerization process and a polymerization process. So you have these two processes working to shape these networks. Either they come apart and you end up with uh, sort of remnants of it on the granule, at, or you get polymerization and they join the, they're also attracted to this granule and come back together as a network. Our work suggests that proteins and other objects in the cell have a nonspecific affinity for droplet interfaces that increases with the contact area and becomes most apparent when they have no preference for the interior of a droplet over the rest of the cytoplasm. We validate this basic physical phenomena in vitro through the interaction of simple protein RNA condensates with microtubules. So I don't know, they have some pictures here. They have the stress granules and the surrounding microtubule network. You see the microtubule network and um, that's in, in A and then in B, you have channels of the same cell after 90 minutes of arsenic treatment. So you have these different treatments that they did to look at like the stability and, and um, different things about this network. Uh, microtubule networks are modulated in the pres presence of stress granules. Uh, you get this, um, you know, you get this response when stress granules are in the area versus not. So the microtubule network is always really forming a network, but they don't necessarily organize around anything specifically, uh, the stress granules being one exception to that. So this is kind of what they're showing here. And then uh, finally, I don't know if there are any other images we're showing here. Uh, this is talking about tubule one subunits uh, adhering to the granule surface in uh, noco dizoli treated cells. So this is where they treat it with a drug and they want to see tubule one subunits adhere to the granule surface. And they build a mathematical model and they're able to fit the theory to the data. So that's all I have for you today on those papers. Hope you learned something. All right. Well, thanks for meeting. Um, okay. And yeah, have a good week. So, sorry to be a wet noodle. Oh, that's no, fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. Um, okay. Have a good day. Okay. It's all fantastic. Anyway, yeah. thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.